Australia is a very dry continent. Most of its rivers run inland. They end up in a lake or in a salt pan or just disappear in the desert. There are a few exceptions. Darling Murray River is the longest river of Australia. Darling starts from somewhere in Queensland and Murray in New South Wales. The two join and they end up in the sea near Adelaide. The longest river of Australia makes a dramatic entry into the ocean. It enters into a lagoon about 150 kilometers long and 3 kilometers wide. This long neck of water is called Karang by local Aborigines and it means exactly that, a long neck of water. Murray River water enters as fresh water in Karang. By the time this water comes out at the other end, it is saltier than sea. Walkandi! Rika! Naranjari people lived on the land using its bush and resources. There was a special bush apple which they used to make cake which could last for many months. Shelter was obtained from trees and shrubs. On the sand dunes between the ocean and the lagoon, many middens that is primitive stone huts have been found. Naranjari was very sporting, they loved the sports, they loved competition and uh, they were good at uh, what they done, they were good at the, at the, at the spear throwing, they were good at the boomerang throwing, they were good at the hunting as they had the fishing competitions in, in and around the lake. There was a prize for the best, uh, best fish that was, uh, was speared so it was a gathering of the clans for the for the uh, competition. It was like a game between all the different eighteen different clans of the Ngāniri nation. They would have dancing then that would go right into the night till early hours of the morning. Roma. Falco. The water of the lakes was very salty, but Naranjari people knew how to get fresh water. Dig a hole about one meter deep and wait, and you will get fresh water to quench your thirst in no time. During the heydays of gold rush in Australia, many Chinese got off the boats near Karang and would walk to gold fields. On their way, they dug many wells to get fresh water. Geometric precision of their well making can be seen from the stones that they cut to make wells. Tom Trevera, I'm Nigeri from the Koro, manager of Camp Koro, and cultural teacher, they teach people, share with people about who we are as Ngāniri people, about our, our identity, our culture, our heritage, our beliefs, our lands and our waters, our connection to our country. Uh, we do that here at Cap Kurong as a part of uh, sharing our culture. The Kurong is a very significant part of our country. Uh, our ancestors lived off the Kurong for thousands of years because it was very, very rich in fish uh, and bird animal supply. And uh, if you travel along the Kurong and over on the uh, sand dunes, you'll find many, many of our old communities, huge midden sites, uh, burial grounds, 
ceremonial sites, our stonefish traps. That's all a part of our heritage, uh, which we are trying to educate people about so we can protect it for our future and for our children's future. We do that uh, by taking people out on our lands and waters and showing them uh, to, uh, to try and help them to understand, to educate them on respecting each other's uh, heritage and culture and beliefs. Naranjari people had lost control of their land. They have just regained a small part of it back. A township, or otherwise three miles out, or seven or ten miles out of the township, because back then you were not allowed to live in the town with white people. Uh, you had to live outside of town. So we lived in the fridge camps. I grew up in a semi-traditional lifestyle, and our old camps were made up of any tin we could find, wheat bags, uh, eucalyptus tree branches, anything to make shelters to keep ourselves warm in the winter time. That was back in the 50s and 60s around this area is uh, a lot of Naranjari people lived in the fridge camps uh, of the towns. You could, uh, if you were considered a good Aboriginal, you could apply for an exemption paper to the government and the welfare and the exemption paper exempted you from being an Aboriginal and it made you a member of the ordinary white society. And if you continued to live on a good satisfactory level, you'd be given an unconditional exemption. So a piece of paper meant to us, it changed you from being a, a black fella and it made you a white fella. Those were the exemption papers. We found them very offensive. It was like selling out your identity. My old mum and dad and uncles and aunties, they wouldn't take them. So that's why we had to grow up in the fridge camps. And here we are, basic camp. Loss of cultural identity has a very profound effect on the society, especially its youth. You know, I think that for so many young Nunga Aboriginal men, you know, there's a sense of wanting something more, a way forward, and uh, and often that can lead people to a point where they don't they they question whether life is worth living. I want to say there's hope. The young fella there, Bonnie, uh, asked us uh, for our blessings upon him because he's going to be working with our youth. A ceremony to cleanse Bonnie and to invoke Naranjari ancestors to help him was quickly planned to be held in a spot on the sacred land in Camp Kurang. Branches of very specific trees were collected to light a fire and other branches from other special trees were collected so that smoke can be generated. Special preparations made from okra were smeared on the bodies of those who were going to participate. When everything was ready, Bani was asked to sit next to the fire so that the elders could perform the ceremony.
spirit will, will make him understand his own own self while he's dealing with, with other problems, the negative problems of society today. So we still use our ancestors. We still use our ancestors every day. Every time we do anything, we use our ancestors. We ask them for help within the Ngarinari land, within our own private homes, we talk to the ancestors. When we do dancing, we talk to the ancestors. When we do ceremonies, our ancestors are there. comes uh, along in maybe in difficult times in the future, he has to think back to what happened to you today. And when he thinks back, then he'll realise these directions that he must take. So that's what we've done here today. It's a traditional ceremony of the Ngarangiri people. We do it for, for strength, for cleansing. We do it for our funeral services. And we do it uh, when we bring our old people's bodies back from another country to be laid to rest in their country. We've done it here on on our land, down on the Kurong here in, in this reserve, which is our own little private piece of land that we've got left where we can carry up our ceremonies. A lot of our land now has become cleared and private property owned by the white fellow. Not much left for the Ngarangiri. This little piece of land is sacred to us to carry out our sacred ceremonies. The significance of the fire is, uh, is uh, fire is to, uh, to heal, and uh, the, uh, the leaves that we use is the tea tree, called Ngarangali. And uh, it's a tea tree that our old ancestors used to smoke away any bad spirits. It's, uh, the old people tell us that it's got strength in it. So that's the, the, the tea tree leaves. The other one was the she oak tree. And the she oak tree is the last tree that our spirit ancestor made when he left Kangaroo Island and he went home to the spirit world. He made a big she oak tree and he rested under it. But the wind down and through the leaves of the she oak tree told him it was time to leave this earth and he went home to Wariwa, to the spirit world. So the she oak tree is a special tree to us, and we use it in these ceremonies. is the feather of the pelican. This feather is for cleansing out the badness within the person's body and to put the spirit of our ancestors into the person's body to help them so that they may have a healthy life. The spirit within them will help them on their way but also give them strength.
Let it go with me, yeah? When you do it, you can use it. Thank you. That's from now in this area, from the Quran? Yep. It's a pelican feather that we use for our, for our uh, healing and that. So, the help you, I use that in my healing for many, many years. So it's got a lot of stories in it. Thank you. And that way it'll help you to, to do what you have to do. Thank you. Thank you. As a blessing, I feel incredibly honoured and privileged to have two elders of the Northern Jedi Nation here to bless my work. I, I bring some expertise, but expertise is one thing, a blessing is another. Consultation is one thing, but permission is another. And I am incredibly thankful for what has occurred here today. And the, honestly, I feel something, something has come over me, something has blessed my work here today. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm excited about the work that we're going to go out. There's hope here. And, uh, and today I've been given hope to pass on. And I really want the ancestors of Narangiri, whose children's children's children I work with, to bless this work. Recommend it absolutely. I think too often uh, non-Indigenous people have just come in to do work instead of getting permission. I have felt here a sense of, I don't know, I don't know, it's, how do you describe spirit? How do you describe that sense of, of being that touches your own? Certainly today I have felt that. Certainly today I have felt like something has, I don't know, touched me inside and given me permission to do the work. When I was sitting by the fire here and my, while the ceremony was taking place, a shiver went through my body. I don't know what that means. Only that something has happened here for me today.